Today we're continuing with the multiplication rule. On Monday we got started with it and did pretty basic problems. We started out as simple as we had four aces in our hands and we're looking at conditional probabilities and the end event, two trials with or without replacement. We're going to build on that today and talk some more, just some more examples of the product rule and then start working with conditional probabilities. <coughs> conditional probabilities won't be on your quiz on Friday. We can start with that today, though. Okay, first, another example of material that will be on the quiz on Friday. This concept of using the rule of complements. We know if I have the event E, its complements denoted as E bar, and I know the probability of E plus the probability of its complement is equal to 1. Because taken together, they're everything, aren't they? The complement is not what's in E, it's everything else. You often run into complements with problems that have the phrase at least 1. And I want you to be really focus in on that. When you see that phrase, immediately a red flashing light goes off and say, oh, I might be using the complement here. Because it's often easier to find the probability of the complement than the initial event. Let's do a simple problem, then we'll do a more complicated one. And here's just a rewrite of the equation I put up here. The probability of at least one, that's my event E, its complement is none. So I have this simple little algebraic equation that relates the two. So let's suppose we're taking a quiz that has four multiple choice questions. And each question has five possible answers. And, and the rear unlikely event that you have no idea what any of the answers are, right? that would never happen. But on that rare occasion, if you had to guess all five all four questions. What's the probability that you get at least one right? One out of the four. All right, well that's that key phrase again, isn't it? At least one. So the probability of at least one correct answer, we're going to flip it around, and we're going to look at the complement. And I know the probability of at least one answer is one minus its complement, which would be no correct answers. Okay, well that's one minus, well no correct answers, that means I've got four wrong answers. I guessed incorrectly four times in a row. Well what's the probability of the first problem? There are five options, A through E. If you're just guessing randomly, what's the chance you'll be wrong? Four out of five, right? Four chances out of five you'll be wrong. That's the first trial. Now I'm multiplying those together for the second, third, fourth trial. How can I get away with that? What, what allows me to do that in this situation? It seems like a, a reasonable thing to do. When can I just multiply probabilities of successive trials? Is that keeps uh, yeah, it's beyond that. It's, it's a fundamental property of this procedure. I'll give you a hint, it's underlined. The events are independent. Making a guess on one question and getting the right answer is independent of making a guess on the second. It's a lot like flipping coins, isn't it? Right. And in that case, probability of getting a wrong answer here doesn't matter if I got a wrong or right answer in the previous one. Okay, key, key observation. <coughs> so in that case, I can just multiply the four probabilities together, the four probabilities of getting a wrong answer, and I get 4096, 0 0.4096. That's the probability of getting four wrong answers. I subtract that from one, and I get the probability of at least one correct answer. <coughs> now, why is that such a big improvement? 
Well, think of what you'd have to do to calculate the probability of at least one correct answer. You'd have to find the probability of getting one correct answer. Then you'd have to uh, accommodate the chance you got two correct answers, because two is at least one. Then you'd have to calculate the probability of three correct answers, and then four correct answers. You'd have four probabilities to calculate. And then you'd have to carefully put them together using the OR rule to get the final answer of probability of at least one. So a much more complicated problem, isn't it? And this is very direct. All right, let's go to an interesting example of the complement rule. It's famously known as the birthday problem. I think right now in this room we have 21 or 22 people. What's the probability that at least two of us will share a birthday? <coughs> Not talking about year, just day and month. Day and month out of, actually here I'm doing a calculation for 25. So if you had to bet on one of these three, what would you guess? Or would you come up with a different number? Then Dinah, what do you think? Two people, at least two people out of this room, let's pretend we had three more people to make it 25. What's the probability that they would share a birthday out of 365 days in a year? Um, would it be A? He says A. How many would think A? Come on, raise your hand if you do. No? How many would say B? Yeah, it's got right numbers there, doesn't it? You see a 365, that's appealing. You see a 25, yeah, that's kind of appealing. How many would say C? Ah, contrarian. <laughs> she knows I'm setting you up, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. C is the right answer. Let's do a calculation and see why this is, that's the right answer. We use the complement rule. Now, this would be incredibly complicated if I tried just brute force do it. I've got 25 people, 365 days, and the probability of at least two of us having the same birthday. That's complicated enough. But when I said at least two, I'd also have to calculate the probability that maybe three of us did or four of us, or five of us. Are you getting a headache yet? That, that is not a fun thing to do. Well, to some people, it might be fun. But there's an easier way. What's the complement of at least one? None. So the probability of at least one pair of the same birthday is the same as one minus the probability of no pairs with the same birthday. And I claim that we can calculate that. So we get started, the first person, I'll go first, March 8th. Anybody here born on March 8th? No? All right. I'm the first one to go, so I can pick any of 365 out of 365 days, it doesn't matter. <coughs> After that, Paul's going to go. And if we want case there's no pairs with the same birthday, what choices are there for him? Yeah, March 8th is gone. So he's got to pick one of the other 364 out of 365. And then we continue down the road. Sanford Crane. Well, he can't pick my birthday or Paul's birthday. He's got to be yet a different one. So. 363 over 365, and the dot, 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 it'd be all the way down to 341 over 365. Now that's not a, an easy number to calculate, but with enough patience on the HP calculator, you can do that. And in about a week, I'll show you how to do it much <coughs> quicker when we get into permutations and combinations. But when you multiply all these together, you can see these numbers are around 0.9 and change. It's starting out as 0.99, and then by the time you get down here, it's about 0.93. But you're multiplying them together 25, 24 times. And when you do that, that's approximately 
This expression right here in parentheses is approximately 0.431. I subtract that from one, and I see there's a better than 50% chance that in a room of 25 people, two people share a birthday. Now, in my class this morning, there's exactly 25 of us, and we did have one common birthday. Let's see it. Let's see if it works. Here, our probability is a little bit lower. At 23, is about 50-50. We have, I think, 22 right now, so we're at a little bit less than a 50% chance. <coughs> Let's go around the room, shout out your birthday, and if you hear your birthday mentioned, raise your hand. March 8th. December 6th. April 20th. October 13th. Hear these? Mm -hmm. Gotta be loud. October 13th. December 15th. August 25th. February 10th. March 16th. June 18th. May 23rd. November 8th. February 14th. April 7th. September 26th. June 28th. We gotta do it. September 24th. Close, but doesn't count. June 25th. June 16th. September 17th. October 19th. That's your code. December 28th. We didn't get one. No? All right. Well, that's the way we practically flipped a coin. We got a tail instead of a head. So this morning's class it came out, yeah, we had one, about well, two of the cadets had the same birthday. This is an example. <coughs> And I'm going to show you another example at the end of class. We're actually going to treat today. You're going to see a small YouTube video. Did that YouTube in math class? We don't always do a good job of assessing uh, risks, probability, or uncertainty. Sometimes we're good at it. Sometimes we're not very good. And this is a perfect example. Few people would guess that out of in a room full of 25, there's a 50% chance of having two birthdays the same. It just doesn't seem likely, does it? How could that be? But it is. Okay. That's the line between the material on the quiz, and now I'm going to move into new material that will not be on the quiz. The first equations are product rule that we derived worked with in the last class. And I'm using this notation now, that that and, which means compound <coughs> event happening single trial. And that is the product rule formula. Now that's just a regular algebraic equation. I can do all the operations I'm permitted under the rules of mathematics. And I can just divide both sides by the probability of A, as long as the probability of A is not zero. And I get this equation. All right, so what's the big deal? Well, it's sometimes we're interested in the conditional probability and not the other probabilities. I use this equation if I want to know the probability of A and B, the top equation. <coughs> But there's lots of cases where I want to know a conditional probability. And then I can rewrite, rewrite that top equation into this <coughs> one. It gives me a way to calculate. All right, we're going to work with uh, this example for the, for the rest of the class. It's a polygraph lie detector test. Anybody here ever take a polygraph test? No? Well, I've taken a number of them. Tron goes wondering, why did he take a lie detector test? It was for a security clearance. But not pleasant. Assume 98 people took a lie detector test. And what are the possibilities? Well, either the person lied or they didn't. And either the machine, the test, suggested or indicated they lied, or it did not. So every person out of that 98, I could put them in one of these four squares. Correct? It's just a contingency table. In red, I put the numbers that would represent errors, 
where the lie detector got the wrong result. And these two corners, it got it right. False negatives, false positives. So if you're the subject of a lie detector test, you're rooting for one of these additional probabilities to be high and the other, another one to be low. In the, in the following examples, we're going to use these events. T would be the person who really told the truth. L, the person told a lie. A plus will indicate a positive test result, and that always indicates that a lie. That's just the way they say it. A positive polygraph result means we think you lied. And a negative polygraph result would mean it looks like you didn't lie. Right? So keep that in your mind, and we're going to practice a bit with conditional probabilities, because these get to be tricky. I want you to look at that notation and translate it to an English sentence. Now, probability of T given a positive result. I'll do the first one. When you translate these, remember the vertical bars translate that given that. And everything to the right of the vertical bar, we presume we already know that to be true. So the first one would be the probability that someone told the truth, given that the lie detector thought they lied. The second one. Fred Barton, translate that for me, please. Probability that the person did lie to the truth. Okay, what's that plus mean? Positive. So positive means the machine said you lied. You lied. Given that, you told the truth. You told the truth. Right. Now, would you like that probability to be high or low? Low. Yes. If you're telling the truth, you don't want to be accused of telling it, being told a lie. All right. How about the third one? Okay, terrific. The P negative line L. Yes. Okay. Let's make an English sentence out of that that anyone could understand. Um, so the fact that a person told the wrong answer and the machine didn't catch it. Let's let's uh, construct the sentence in the order from left to right. I think that's the easiest. So it's the probability that, and I'm always looking for the probability of the event to the left of the vertical line. It's the probability that the machine didn't catch the line. It's the probability the machine said you're not lying. That's a minus. It indicated no lie. Given that, they lied. You lied. So in this case, did the machine catch it? No, you got away. All right. You have to track over, you do the last one, please. Uh, probability that the machine says that you lied and you did actually lie. So that means it caught you. That's the probability it's going to catch you if you actually lie. Now let's go the other way around. The, this is the sentence of the statement. Translate it into a conditional probability using that notation. Uh, Van Dyne? Uh, would be if he um, uh, L over the line and uh, positive. Okay, translating this from left to right, right would be the probability that someone lied with that the machine said you lied. Is that what the sentence says? Probably the person who told a lie, so what do I know? What's given? You lie. You know that. So that's the given. But is it going left to right? Well, my notation does, but in good old English, I can put them in any order. And that's one of the challenges of this. What do I know in the sense? 
person who told a lie. So I know you told a lie. That has to be the given part. That goes to the right of the first line. And the probability that it was detected by the machine, so it'd be that. Mm -hmm. So why is the first one like, the first, um, not the first sentence of the first like, example, the mathematical equation, why is the T on the left side? Up here, the very first one? Yes, sir. All right, in that situation, what do you know? All you know, pretend you are the operator of the machine, and you know you got a positive result. Mm. Oh, okay. And it, you're not you know sure if this positive. person's lying or not, mm -hmm. but that P of T given positive is the probability that they're lying. Okay. Right? So just the definite side always, is always on the right. Yeah. On the right is what you know, or what's happened, what's given, however you want to think of it. Okay? Uh, well, let's go ahead and uh, let's do the last one here. Where am I? Um, probability of P of <coughs> minus given L. This English can get tricky. But I give you, you might I actually it. switch. Right? What what are we what's it suggesting we know here? Person was falsely accused of telling a lie. So they're falsely accused of telling a lie. They told the truth. They told the truth. And if they are falsely accused of it, what was the test? What did it indicate? These are not easy. I've seen over the years teaching it. That's why I introduced these slides. You've got to practice thinking about what the conditional probabilities mean and be able to translate back and forth from the English to the math and the math to the English. Well, now that we've done that, let's actually calculate some of these probabilities. Given this contingency table. The first one we'll do is the probability that the person told the truth, given that the machine said you're lying. <coughs> All right, I'm going right to the formula, and that's the formula, except I put, instead of A's and B's, I've got T's and pluses. So let's plug in here. What is the probability of T and plus? So, Think of this, I'm picking a person at random from the 98. What's the probability that they told the truth, but the machine said they lied? There are 15 of those, right? You see it? That's a, what we're going to call a joint probability. That's 15. So that probability is 15 out of 98. That's the numerator. Keep in mind experiment again. I'm picking one of those 98 people at random. And what's the probability that that person I selected at random was accused of lying? The machine said, you're lying. How many times did that happen? 57 times. 57 times the machine said or indicated that person's lying. And when you divide those two fractions, you get 15 over 57. That's the, probability. That's the conditional probability. We'll practice this a few more. Let me show you a shorter way to get to it, a more graphical way. I'm interested in the probability of t given plus. If you have a contingency table, you've got a nice graphical tabular representation of the data and I can make use of that. If I'm given plus, that means I know that the machine indicated a lie, I can, I can ignore rows or columns that are, don't indicate that. For example, the first row is the only row that says the machine indicated a lie. The second row, the machine did indicate a lie. But I can ignore this row because I've been told that the machine said this person lied. 
So I can just ignore that row, the second row. And I'm left with this row. Okay, how many are in that row? How many times did the machine say someone lied? 57. Of those 57 people, when the machine said you lied, how many of them are telling the truth? 15. So the conditional probability is 15 out of 57. Easier? Let's do a few more just to practice with that. I want you to mentally be erasing rows or columns, just focusing in on one. Uh, which one did I just do? Plus and T? Uh, so that's, yeah, we did T and pluses, let's do plus and T. Which row or column can I eliminate from consideration here? No, we did it the other way around. I'm on this one right here. First one. I've given T, the person told the truth. Which row or column am I focused on? And all the others I'll ignore. Yeah. Forget about these. I'm just focused on T now. That's what I've been given. That's what I've been told. And how many are there? 47. Now, in this column, how many of those were indicated as a lie, a plus 15. So that is P of plus given T. Let's do another one. Let's do the last one. Plus given L. Which row or column and I cross out T. T. Yes, I can cross out T. So I can focus on L because that's what I've been given. So I can ignore the first column. I'm focused on just the second column and how many outcomes correspond to that? 51. Of those 51 outcomes, how many tested positive? So this number, 42 over 51, is the probability that if you lie, the machine will catch you. The machine got it right that time, didn't it? You lied, and it caught you. I see kids going back and forth, either fighting, sleep, that bothered? What is it? We're just so amazed by conditional improbability. In odd, slapping yourself. Well, at least you're making an effort. The 8 o'clock class this morning, I had to use my grown up voice. All right. Uh, well, we're making good time here. Let's look at another important aspect of this. It's called confusion of the inverse. And I think I heard someone suggest this earlier. So often in math we have things like A times B equals B times A. Or A plus B equals B plus A. And I can switch things around. It doesn't matter about the order, does it? We like it when that happens. That happens quite a bit. Not all the time, but quite a bit. <coughs> now, wouldn't it be nice if the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of B given A? It kind of feels like it should, doesn't it? But it's not. In general, that's not the case. Yes, I can construct examples where that is true, but as a general statement of equality, it's not true because they're really different events. And it's, it's hard to see this at first. Let's go back to our example. Suppose you are a manufacturer of polygraph machines. And you want to put out an advertisement saying that my machine is 
99% accurate in catching lies. <coughs> what prob conditional probability does that 99% represent? My machine is 99% accurate in detecting lies. What's the given in that case? Yes? Uh, it's 99%. Um, uh, it catches lies 99% of the times. All right. Yes. In our conditional probability notation, how would I write that probability? Uh, positive response for every line. How could you test a polygraph machine? Well, you'd have to know if the person's lying or not, right? How would I test a, a, a test for um, cancer? I'd have to know if the person had cancer or not. So I'd have to get a group of people together and say, all right, some of you lie to me, some of you tell the truth. And then when I'm done with my studies, I'll say, okay, of all those that lied, 99% of the time, I found it. That's what that probability means. Is that the same as this probability? What's the difference between the meaning of these? You've got to be subtle at first. Get your brain a little bit twisted, doesn't it? What do you know here? What the machine said. What the machine said. So now you'd be in the role of the operator of the machine. I'm operating the machine, and I've had the student in my room for an hour. And I've been brewing him, asking all sorts of questions, watching his heart rate and his breathing rate and how much he's sweating and all that. And I come to the conclusion that he's lying. But what's the probability that he's actually lying? No, it's not 99, it's not 99%. It's a different percentage. It's only 99% accurate if I knew the person's lying to begin with. But just because I detect the lie, it doesn't mean it's 99% likely that that person is actually lying. Let's go back to the problem and calculate these probabilities. Now, in this case, I don't think it's 99% accurate, but let's calculate this probability, P of plus given L. So I'm looking at this column, 51, and how many pluses do I have is 42, and someone get out the calculator and tell me what that is. 0.824. Zero point eight two four. So, um, based on this sample, the lie detector is only accurate in catching lies eighty-two percent of the time. But what's this probability? Well, I've given plus fifty-seven, and what's my how many L's are there? Forty-two, and what's that? Zero point seven three seven. There we go. And this is the more interesting probability because on the real world, when you're taking a polygraph test, this is how they're going to be evaluating you. <coughs> they don't know whether you're lying or not. But this is saying that based their claim has a 0.736 chance of being right. Yeah, I can see smoke coming out of some of the ears now. All right, we will work more with these. Additional probabilities. We'll do a, a lot more examples on, uh, on Friday. Any questions right now? Want me to go back over any of these? Just want me to leave and let you alone? <coughs> That's not an option. Is that Russell? Um, is this section 4.5? It's 4.5. And you said the quiz on Friday is 4.4? This material's not in the quiz. Okay. Right. You need a couple days to let this sink in. This is, this is thinking statistically, probabilistically, and it's not natural. It's not an easy thing to 
to do. I understand that. That takes some practice. Yes. So, um, in like the word problems, when it's saying that you're given something and looking on the chart, that's the column or the row that you're looking at, right? Yeah. Okay. Once you get used to it, these contingency tables are great. We can answer all kinds of questions with this contingency table. For example, uh, this is good. I'll just take you through kind of a, a sequence of the kinds of problems we can answer. If I randomly select one of these 98 people, what's the probability that they told the truth, but the machine indicated and the machine indicated that they did not lie? What's that? <coughs> 32. 32 out of 98. 98. Did you follow that? Single trial, compound event. Out of these 98 people, 32 of them told the truth and the machine agreed with them, said you didn't lie. Okay. That was lesson four three. Okay. Now I randomly select a person out of 98. What's the probability that person told the truth? Excellent. 47 out of 98. I randomly select a person out of 98. What's the probability they told the truth or the, the machine indicated that they lied? You're probably going to want to get a piece of paper for that one. What's this an example of what technique that we want to also be the inclusive? Inclusive or. It's inclusive or, right? So it's the addition rule. So let's go and write this carefully here. Now remind me what I said. I can't remember. You said they told the truth, but the, the machine said they lied. Or the machine said Or the machine said they lied. Uh -huh. T or plus. What's my formula? Probability of T plus, plus probability of can you see that that's just the addition rule? Yes. A's and B's are replaced, replaced with T's and pluses. All right, so let's go through and calculate this. The probability of someone telling the truth out of the sample. 47 out of 98. The probability of having a positive test result. 57. <coughs> now, what's the probability, this is an, an and, joint probability, of telling the truth and having it uh, say you lied? 15. So, what is that all together? 89. So it's a pretty high chance that one of those two things happen. So from this little contingency table now, we've seen we can solve four different kinds of probability problems. Okay. All right. Now for your treat for the day. A YouTube. Can you believe it? Let me. All right, a little bit of well, background. A little bit of background. TED Talks, my favorite way to spend lunch. This man is a professional statistician, and people actually are the living doing this. And he especially is calculating the probability involved with genetics. And this is a talk he gave. And a lot of the theme about it is how sometimes humans do a really, really poor job of grappling with uncertainties or probabilities. 
earlier on we saw how difficult it was for you to believe that's a 50 50 chance of two people having the same birthday if there's 25 in the room. That's just counterintuitive, isn't it? All right. He's going to describe a real world case now where a very blatant error in statistics or probability was caused a lot of grief and uh, anguish to a person. Each of them taken together is unlikely. Here's a more topical example of exactly the same thing. Those of you in Britain uh, will know about what's become rather a celebrated case of a woman called Sally Clark who had two babies who died suddenly. And initially it was thought that they died of what's known informally as cop death and more formally as sudden infant death syndrome. For various reasons, she was later charged with murder. And at the trial, her trial, a very distinguished pediatrician gave evidence that the chance of two cop deaths Innocent deaths in, in a family like hers, which was professional and non-smoking, was one in 73 million. Kind of long story short, uh, she was convicted at the time. Later, fairly recently, acquitted on appeal. In fact, on the second appeal. Uh, and, and just to set it in context, you can imagine how awful it is for someone to have lost one child and then two. Uh, if they're innocent, to be convicted of murdering them, to be put through the stress of the trial convicted of murdering them and to spend time in a women's prison where all the other prisoners say, you killed your children. A really awful thing to happen to someone. And it happened in large part here because the expert got the statistics horribly wrong. In two different ways. So where did he get the 1 in 73 million number? <coughs> he looked at some research which said the chance of one cop death in a family like uh, Sally Clark's is about 1 in 8,500. So he said, I'm assuming that if you have one cop death in a family, the chance of a second child dying from cop death are changed. All right, suppose you're on the defense team, your legal counsel. Educated person had three years of education beyond college. And the prosecution brings up this information. Are you going to raise your hand and say, Your Honor, I object? Are, what are you going to say? Do you have an objection? Really no, I'll, I'll do it. Bob, it's going to object? On what grounds? I uh, don't think that's how it should be done. Okay, but you know, the judge is going to say, why? What's your expert witness? What is wrong with this reasoning? Yes, Your Honor, I'd like to bring in my old teacher, Mr. Blathford, to the big day. Oh, I've heard of him. I've seen his YouTubes. <laughs> They're famous. Uh, but he can't be there. You'll have to testify. Yes? Were the children twins? No, they were born uh, separate, separate, two separate births. Well, this is simple. I have similar genetics. If one of them is susceptible to death, and the second one, since they share a lot of the same genes, you might have like a hereditary, might be like prone to having the same problems. Excellent. He's on to something. So, in math speak, how would we describe these events? They're dependent on the well, Are they dependent or independent? What assumption is being made by this doctor, this pediatrician? Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, they say they're independent. Hey, there's one in 8,500. You got a second one. That's one in 8,500. Guess what? That's a probability. But are they really independent events? Genetics, sure. Environmental factors. There's lots of reasons why they not, might be dependent. And this is a blatant. <laughs> error in calculating probabilities, right? We know that. 105. But it's so sad that this pediatrician didn't know that. All those lawyers on either side didn't know that. The judge didn't know that. And they went on and she was convicted. That's what statisticians would call an assumption of independence. It's like saying if you toss a coin and get a head the first time, that won't affect the chance of getting a head the second time. So if you toss a coin, tw coin twice, the chance of getting a head twice summation is really silly. It's worse than silly, it's really bad science. 
Nonetheless, that's how it was presented, and at trial, nobody even argued it. That's the first uh, problem. The second problem is, what does 173 million mean? So after Sally Clark was convicted, you can imagine it made rather uh, a splash in the press, one of the journalists from, from uh, Britain, one of Britain's more reputable newspapers, wrote that what the expert had said was the chance that she was innocent was one in 73 million. And that's a logical error. It's exactly the same logical error as the logical error of thinking that after the disease test, which is 99% accurate, the chance of having the disease is 99%. In the disease example, we had to bear in mind two things, one of which was the possibility that the test got it right or not, and the other one was the chance a priori that the person had the disease or not. It's exactly the same in this context. There are two things involved, two parts to ex the explanation. We want to know how likely, or relatively how likely, two different explanations are. One of them is that Sally Clark was innocent, which is a priori overwhelmingly likely. Most mothers don't kill their children. And the second part of the explanation is that she suffered an incredibly unlikely event. Not as unlikely as one in 73 million, but nonetheless rather unlikely. All right, so the first cut of error you, you detected, it's this independent versus dependent, very blatant. What he's talking about now is a conditional probability, a wrong way of reasoning about uncertainty. We touched upon it today, and I'll, I'll bring it up again Friday. It's, it's much more subtle, and it, it's hard to grasp. But it was fundamentally flawed way of thinking about that odds of 73 million to one. Another famous example, this is, I don't know if you would remember, the O.J. Simpson case. That's another one you see in example statistics when uh, they're looking at, I think the, uh, it was the fact that he had uh, struck her and physically abused her, and the defense said, oh, that all happens one in 9,000 times. So ignore it. Uh, don't do a good job reasoning about uncertain probabilities. And here's a tragic example. Uh, as he said, she went to prison after the second appeal. The second appeal, she got out. But tragically, uh, seven years later, she committed suicide due to an error in math. So I will be see tonight. Do your stat lab. I'll see you Friday. <laughs>